a wizard. I'll do my best, thank you. Hi everyone, welcome again. Now you know who I am, but just in case you've forgotten, I'm Laura, and I work at SGI in London. And thank you for staying to the end of today, because as Caroline said, it's quite a long weekend when there's so much good stuff going on. And I'm going to try and finish on a high with some different kinds of fun activities that you can use to make more of this big board that's in the front of every classroom. Whether it's a chalkboard or a whiteboard or an interactive whiteboard, we're going to look at different ways of using it. Um, and actually, to that end, can I just check here who teaches in an environment with a chalkboard? To whiteboard? Uh, interactive whiteboard? One first. Okay. Fine. We've so, got Beamer and a computer. It's us. Oh, good point. Beamer and a computer as well? Yeah. We have it, but I don't know how to use it. And you don't know how to use it? Oh, good. Oh, well, then maybe you'll know. And a flip chart. That's supposed to be a flip chart. Sometimes we're lucky enough to. I have a very quick. Okay. okay. Well, the idea that I've tried to stick to for this workshop is to make every activity as flexible as possible. Um, because I've moved around uh, through quite a few different schools, and we've had different board facilities. So a lot of what I've done, I've adapted so that I can take my favorite activities with me wherever I go. Not everything is 100% flexible, but I'll explain how as we go. Um, so, oh, and I should also say that in the interest of saying paper, and because everything is mostly related to a board, I haven't made a handout, so I've actually put notes online on my blog, which is here. And I'll give you the link again at the end of the workshop. So if you want to um, keep copies of what we've done, I'll put the slides and other relevant information on the blog so you can get it later. So, um, first just some general principles on why I love using the board. It's great for getting students out of their chairs. I don't know how long the lessons are in your teaching environments, but mine are never shorter than 90 minutes, and some of them are two hours. And 90 minutes is just the first half of a three-hour morning slot. And some of the students don't like to go out in the break. They just like to sort of stay in the room. But then I find, as I often have the second class, they're very lethargic. And I like doing things here at the front of the class where they have to get up and move. And in a moment, we're going to do a demonstration with some of the lovely people I'm sure will be willing to help me. It's good for putting students in control of tasks. And depending on your student's background, I don't know. Does anybody here teach in Switzerland? Yes. Anybody not teaching six or eleven? Just hear me. <laughs> okay, I don't know a lot about the, the Swiss education system, I admit, and what your students are bringing to the classroom, but I know that a lot of my students aren't used to having that much control over what they do in the classroom. They often expect the teacher to take a leading role, um, and whatever that may mean for different activities, I don't know. But certainly they don't usually, they're not usually allowed to touch the computer or the board. But I actually like to let them, and it puts them in the driving seat, and they seem to get quite a lot out of it. So some of the activities I'll show you will demonstrate that. Um, I like to use it for feedback on tasks, rather than just if you've done an exercise with 10 questions, OK, what's number one, number two, number three? But sometimes you can use the board for that. Um, that can make things a little bit more interesting, maybe just a bit different. Or also, again, put them in control of the feedback, so you step back, and they're in charge of organizing the information. I really like to use it for recording things and organizing things. And I know that recording doesn't seem like something you would normally do with a board, even an interactive whiteboard, but I'll show you what I mean in a moment, because you can keep a record of what's there and organize it and reuse it later. And I find that saves me a lot of time rewriting things. It also just saves general lesson time. Um, I like to use it for revising at the end of a lesson or at the start of another, and I'm going to show you another example. And I love to use it for competitive activities. Um, that board there becomes a kind of game board. And that's actually the first thing that I'm going to show you. So, more specifically, these are what I'm going to show you in the workshop. We're going to do a whiteboard race, which is a physical race, and that's why I'm going to ask for your help in a moment. If you're wearing flat shoes, that would be good. <laughs> um, a second version of a race, which has a track, which I'll also show you. Um, a game grid in kind of high tech version for those of you who have an interactive whiteboard or a beamer. Um, a low-tech version for those of you who don't, maybe have a flip chart or a chalkboard. Um, an, in an interactive game which I like and I've used. 
um, dictation and transcription, which again might seem unusual to transfer that from paper to the board, but there's a reason why I like it, and I'll show you. And an instant gap fill. Gap filling, I think, has a sort of slightly negative connotation, but this is a good one. So I'll show you an example at the end. So I need some helpers for our first whiteboard race. I need six people. I've already basically chosen two who I'm hoping will help me. Four more people? Go on, come on, come up here, please. One, two, come on, Jeremy, come on, Caroline. Two more? Or one more? You don't have to be super fast. You don't have to be your same bolt or anything. Yeah, come on. So, can you three lovely ladies form a queue here? One, two, three, facing the board. Like this. And you three do the same here. One, two, three, facing the doors. Can people behind, can you still vaguely see what's going on? Mm -hmm. so you to one side. Can move this way slightly. This way slightly. <laughs> the idea is this. You have something to practice, something that students have seen before, but they struggle to remember, or they constantly um and ah and correct themselves and change their mind. You put half of that information here, the other half should be here, in their heads. The example I'm going to show you is with dependent prepositions. So on the board we have on, for, to, in, and of. Are we going to use these pins? No. No. So that's how, I was wondering how to use those. <laughs> so this could be done with an interactive whiteboard, it could be done with a regular board or a flip chart or anything. The idea is simply that when I call out a verb, which requires one of these prepositions, the first people need to race and touch the correct preposition. Mm. You can also do this with fly swatters. You can do it with fly swatters. Yes. Yeah, exactly. You can also do it where they take a pen and they circle okay. the right one, which helps later to count. You can switch that on red pen and green pen. Yeah. It doesn't work so well with interactive whiteboards with pens because the board doesn't like it if two pens touch the board at the same ah, time. So okay. I'm just going to let you use your hands. And you'll see how it works. Are you ready? So what are you supposed to do? I just touch it right now. Not, not touch the pens. Touch you touch the correct preposition for the verb that I give you. So okay. if I say refer, when <laughs> <laughs> you go to the end of the line, the next person is going to go to the end of the Believe. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Concentrate. Works really nicely with young learners. 
As Caroline mentioned, you can use fly swatters. Children seem to like that, being allowed to hit something hard, which they're not normally allowed to Wouldn't recommend it with an interactive whiteboard. <laughs> Fragile technology. Uh, but that's basically all there is to it, and it's usually a lot of fun. Very easy to set up. Very easy to use with all levels. And even all types of class. I mean, even classes that you might think would be a bit more reserved, sort of business English. They get just as into this as anybody else does. That element of competition is really interesting. Um, so, another kind of whiteboard race that I use is a racetrack. And it looks like this. I'm actually going to show you for the benefit change it slightly and use it here. Now, the way that this works is the students are in groups, and I like to use this for the kind of activity that tends to be a little bit dull, but you have to do it. For example, if you're working with a course book, there's a page at the end which has a unit review. There's six exercises on the page, mm -hmm. and I find it often gets set for homework because it's a bit boring to just go exercise one, now let's do exercise two, now let's do exercise three. And there's no engagement, but you feel like you need to do it because you do need to revise what's in the book. So the students' groups become teams, and the idea is that they work through the exercises, and for every exercise they get right, they move one space along the board. There is one stage fewer than there are exercises. So if you have eight exercises, you just have seven steps on the board, so that each team has the option of leaving out one and they feel like there's a better chance of them winning the race. Now, careful rules, which must be applied to avoid cheating, is that within each group, they can only work on one exercise together at a time. Mm -hmm. So if you're a group of three, you can't be doing one while you do another and you do another, because that's just a bit unfair, you can't control the pace so well. So they must work together, they can only do one at a time, and if you think they're gonna cheat, I usually photocopy it, cut up the exercises and put them in an envelope so you can see that they've only got one <laughs> at a time. You stay where you are, and when they're done the exercise and they're ready to see if they've got it right, one of their group runs up and brings it to you. You check their answers, and if there's anything wrong, you just circle that one and give it back to them. And they have to go back to their table and fix it together. And then they come back and try again. And at the moment when they have everything right, and that exercise, then that means they can move one step along the board. They don't need to do the exercises in any specific order. Doesn't matter where they start. And remember that they can choose one which they don't want to do and leave it out. Okay. After the lesson, I usually get them to go home and fill that in at home. This homework anyway. It's a little bit quicker. They remember it. They do the exercise they tried to leave out earlier. And there's a chance to sort of keep notes on what they did in class. But it just makes it a bit more interesting. We're going to do an example together, and let's see, there's 14 of you, so you get three, and you get three, and you get four, and you get four. Say hi to the people next to you, they're now your teammates. If I can have your attention before the race begins, in the interest of saving paper, I haven't given you a worksheet, but I'm going to tell you that you've got five tasks of which you'll choose four. So can someone in your group just make a note of what the five tasks are? With students, obviously, these would be language exercises. For you, I'm going to give you trivia, just so you feel how it feels to be the student. So task number one would be to name all 50 U.S. states. <laughs> task number, don't start it yet. <laughs> don't start it yet, just make a note. Task number two, name 10 London underground stations in the center. So one. <laughs> task number three. Name three locations which were used for the London 2012 Olympics. Three locations used in London 2012. London doesn't count. Name six major cities in Scotland. And task number five. 
Wait, 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 don't do it yet, don't do it yet. <laughs> Task number five, name four of the six Australian states. Uh, <laughs> now wait, before you start... <laughs> wait please, before you start, you need to choose a vehicle to move along the racetrack. And with students, I like to choose unconventional things. So your options are a unicycle, a chicken, a pogo stick, a hot air balloon, and a Ferrari motorcycle. <laughs> Team at the front, which vehicle would you like? Ferrari. Yeah, let's go with Ferrari. <laughs> Ferrari, okay. We're going to be hot air balloon. Hot air balloon? The motorcycle's taken. Okay. This is a unicycle. Okay, we're like Scotia. And no, we don't want the chicken. Not the chicken. Okay, you're the pogo stick. Uh, can I just ask a question? What is that? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you in a moment. What's what? Okay, are you ready? Listen carefully. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. Listen carefully. Unicycle team. So, remember how many you can work on at one time. Just one together. When you think you've done it, what do you do with your answers? Bring them here. I'm going to stay here. If you make any mistakes, what will I do? Send you back. When you get them all correct, what happens? You can then take another set of questions. I can move you one space and you start the next one. On your marks. Yes. Yes. Get set. Go. Okay. Baker Street. Houston, Victoria. Houston. St. James's, Green Park.
because that's on the other side. I don't really call it Mason or Shirt City. I think.
Um, there is a low-tech version, which I'm going to show you. But the stuff that's behind squares, that, this I did with the CAE class as an example. Behind one of the squares was a use of English task. Behind another one was a, something, a, some mistakes to correct. And behind certain squares, there were special things. So some of them had lightning bolts, which means that you gain five points for free. Some of them had bombs, which means you lose ten points. <laughs> and because I did this during the Olympics, I also had a special bolt. This is Usain Bolt. <laughs> so if they got a lightning bolt, they got five points, and if they got Usain Bolt, they got ten. <laughs> okay, just as a way of doing something a bit different for exam revision, which can be really, really dull. And the idea is that the students, again, were in teams, and the team that chose the square was the one that had primary responsibility for doing the task well or correctly. But the other teams also had to do it, because if the initial team made any mistakes, I opened it up to the class, and they could get the points. Mm. So there was still an incentive for everybody to participate. And again, it's just a way of making it a little bit more interesting than working through the exercises. But as I say, this is a high-tech version, and we're going to do a low-tech version. So, the low-tech version looks like this. You're going to be in your same teams, and we're just going to go one, two, three, four, just to make it easy. Remember that if you choose a square and you correctly answer what's behind it, you get five points. Uh, sorry, ten points, because if you do not correctly answer what's behind it, I let another team guess, and they can get five. They can get half the points if they're patient and correct. Okay, so ten if you get it. Fine if another team gets it. If you get a lightning bolt, five points for free. And if you get a bomb, you lose ten points. Okay, so it's all fives and tens. It sounds a bit tricky, but when you do this regularly with your class, you get used to it and they know the rules. And again, with students, behind these would be language type questions. With you, I've done trivia, I guess. Okay. So, team number one. Five. Your question is, and listen carefully, but don't call out the answer if you know, how many phonemes are there in the, the chart of received pronunciation? Confer, confer. Yeah. And the answer is 42. Uh, 32. <laughs> how many chunks do you get? Phonemes in the received pronunciation for the English chart. Keep four. Is it higher or lower? <laughs> <laughs> you were close, it's at 44. 44. Ah, three years. Unfortunately, no need that. Team number two, pick a number. You have a lightning bolt, so you get five points for free. Oh. Ooh, yes. <laughs> well, I hope you get a bolt. <laughs> I'm not going to... Not you, Susan. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just me. <laughs> okay, so you have five points for free. Team number three, the number. Roughly how many people have attended this weekend's conference? <laughs> Roughly. I'll give you plus or minus five because this is your size. Okay. Not close enough, I'm afraid. Next team. Not close enough, I'm afraid. Two hundred. You think no, it's 320. 200? No, I think it's 320. Alright, 320. Sorry. Sorry, 280. Latest estimate. But that is an estimate. I'll be interested to know later. Where was I? Pick a number? No! What was the name of the singer in the video that you heard me show
do it even if it's a bit. As you can see, it doesn't need to be high tech to work. And I've just written on the back of these questions what the questions were. <laughs> So I jumbled up the letters and his task was to unjumble them and spell the word correctly. So it's a very basic exercise and can be a bit boring, but for some reason associating it with points in a game just made it a bit more interesting. Yes? Yeah. Do you usually put the exercises on a separate piece of paper and give it to them when they pick the number, or do you actually squeeze the right the exercise onto it as you have the questions on the pieces? It depends. It depends what it is. Right. If I do it as a kind of quiz of the week, mm -hmm. I'll just write it like this. Yeah. Um, or it could be again in the book. Mm -hmm. I've done it before. The CAE class, I think we were actually at the end of the book, but we haven't done everything in it. Mm -hmm. So I worked out which bits we hadn't done, mm -hmm. and we just used that. There was a use of English exercise that we hadn't done yet. So, so they gave us a page show and so yeah, it turns out yeah. like It just depends. It was very flexible. Mm -hmm. Because the collocations, couldn't we? You could give half the collocation and they have to um, come up with the word that goes with it. Yeah. That would work nicely for the board race, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, ah, now this is an interactive game. I'm sure you all recognize this format. Yeah. Does anybody not recognize it? It's who wants to be a millionaire. But this is an interactive board. You don't have that? It's on the computer. So you could use it just on a computer screen. Do you have a projector? Yeah. Um, with a projector, I mean. Yes, you could use it with a projector. Oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. This, uh, for this particular activity, this is just a glorified computer screen. Okay. What I can see here, you can see here. It doesn't have to be an interactive one. Okay. It takes a lot of prep, because to make one of these quizzes yourself, you need to create 15 questions, each with four possible answers, and yeah. identify the right one. But, I did this actually with teacher trainees, not with students who are having trouble remembering grammar terminology. And so we made a little quiz out of it. Um, and again, this format just made it that little bit more interesting. And then I sent them the link, because this website, and I'll, I'll give you the link in the, in the blog post for the presentation, mm -hmm. the website allows you to say what you've made and send it by web link. And I made this about three years ago, so that web link is still active. And I emailed it to them afterwards, so when they had home, they could practice them themselves and just through the game. Mm -hmm. And the way that I did it is all of the students sat in a horseshoe, like they usually do, and they took turns one at a time to come and sit in the middle in the hot seat. Mm -hmm. And whereas on the television, the person in the hot seat stays there until they get something wrong or decide to give up, I just got them to take turns. So there was always one of them. Um, they know that the questions get progressively harder, and so they usually agreed amongst themselves who would go first and who was confident enough to wait till later. And it didn't really matter because they were all concentrated to the whole thing. But if they're not sure, they have these lifelines. 50-50 works just as it does on television. So it removes two incorrect answers and they're left with only a choice of two. 
Um, phone a friend, I allow them to ask someone else in the class, only one student who they think will know the answer. Mm -hmm. And they can choose whether they accept that student's answer. And ask the audience works like it does on television, so we do a vote. And the person in the hot seat decides if he wants to go with the most popular answer from the group. So as I said, I did this with teacher trainees who, at, toward the end of their course, before their language awareness test, were completely exhausted and just couldn't face anything anymore. And this was just a bit of a change of tune for them. So you can see how it works and it has sound effects. First question, John fired all his employees. John is A, a verb, B, a pronoun, C, the subject, or D, the object. Is this your final answer? Yes. yes. <laughs> it's very, very simple, but it's amazing how excited adults get about it. It's so different. The sound effects. The only problem is the people in the classroom next door. <laughs> we sometimes get either a little bit angry or a little bit jealous. Yeah. Um, but the website is called, uh, I can't see, but the website is called superteachertools.net. Uh, if you go to .com, it sends you to .net. This is all in the blog post with a link that you can click on, and I'll show you there. Superteachertools.net. You can make your own, you can make as many as you want, it's all free. And they also have other games too, but I only use Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. But they do have other game formats. The other thing I've done with this, with the students this time, is get got them to make a game. So they, we had a, a situation in the school I worked at a few years ago where two different groups were basically doing the same course, but there were just too many students to be in one class. So we had two classes running in parallel. And they made one for the other class. So the idea is that the other students should be able to answer them, but our class is better, so let's give them really hard questions, you know, and they really got into making this. And the process of choosing options, which are similar but not correct, just made them think that bit much more carefully about why this was right and this was wrong. Um, I'm going to move very quickly on, again, for time. So. Can I ask a very good question? Yes. Do you need flash for that? I saw the word flash it, so it wouldn't yes. work on an iPad. It wouldn't work on an iPad. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. I don't think. I haven't tried it, but normally with flash it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. But there might be alternatives out there now. Yeah. I've just been reusing this because I love it and it's, I know it now. Yeah. Um, ah, okay. This, we don't really have time to demonstrate it, so I'll just show you how it works. I like to use the board for dictation and transcription because I find it really helps students focus on the minute details of recordings, songs, and so on, which can be a little bit dull, but they often say that they want, um, and I usually let them choose the recording. Um, this links to a video, um, which I will show you a clip of. This is the video that my students chose last summer. They just watched Adele if you know the singer, mm -hmm. at the Brit Awards, very, very big popular music awards in Britain. Um, oh gosh, not last summer, two summers ago. It's a long time ago. They just watched her performance on television the night before and they loved it and it was amazing and they came in the next day talking about how much they liked her music and how they felt she sang really clearly and they loved it because they could understand. But there were still bits that they weren't sure about and I suppose they could have gone and looked on Google but they hadn't done it yet. So I thought, well, let's do this in class. And it was a very small class, it was about three students, I think, at the time, which made all kinds of peer work impossible. Mm -hmm. And it was just difficult to make it interesting. So they worked as a whole class, all three of them. One person at the board, transcribing. One person at the computer, controlling the video. So I'll play you a bit of it so you can see what they were listening to. <laughs> So it's not slow, but not super fast. It's reasonably clear, and they had chosen it because they loved it, and they thought that they could just about understand it. So one person controlled the video, while one person wrote, 
and one person stood back and kind of watched and helped. And now and again, they would rotate roles. And in the end, or not the end, but not long after, it looked a bit like this. We have projectors in my school. So this was the projector beaming the video onto the board. And I made it a bit smaller, and then they just wrote on the board here. And you can see they've kind of made some changes and bits that are repeated. And you can't see, but there were times when they erased a bit and wrote it again. And I sat back and watched, and I took notes, thinking they can't seem to understand this phrase. Maybe that's because she sound, I don't know, it sounds like this phrase. And they were totally in control, and they had a great time. And they left going, I know all the words, and I can sing along. And to my mind, they'd just done very intensive listening practice. And the reason I put it on the board, rather than on paper, is for two main reasons. One, they actually got out of their chairs, so they moved a bit. And again, they've been sitting down for about two hours at this point. And secondly, because then they didn't have a written record. And what they did is they took a picture of it. And then they used that picture later to test their memory when they wanted to sing along to the song, and they could look at the lyrics. And they made that, and they were quite proud of it. And it was clearly there in their writing, and so it just was a bit more memorable. And then I think that leaves one thing which I want to show you. So, time to revise. I'm going to show you some things on this side of the board which were said yesterday at some point in the plenaries, in um, <laughs> Kendall King's plenary in the morning and in Jeremy's plenary in the afternoon. And let's see if you remember what they said. I'll give you about what time it is, about a minute, to just confer with the people next to you and see if you can remember. idea 
so much stuff goes up on the board during the lesson. You've often got example sentences or things you've corrected or something you've fed in, but maybe it wasn't really relevant to the main part of the lesson, so you put it up there, and then it often gets forgotten. And I find almost every student in my class now has a camera on their phone. So I'll just say, okay, take a picture of it because I'm going to erase it, for example. They'll have a picture, or I will do it. And I won't erase the whole thing. I'll say, close your eyes. I erase a few words. Open your eyes, okay, what's missing? And they have to fill in what's missing. And it just gives them another chance to see that language. So do you erase it off your computer, or is this now on the, on the whiteboard? This is on the actual board, oh, like yeah, I did there. Board. So oh. let's imagine that yesterday I'd written the quotes in full, mm -hmm. and then today I just erased certain key words to see if you could remember. But for language, I would erase things that they were likely to forget, or things they had trouble with in the first place. So as another example, I don't know how well you can see that. I had a, another elementary student who was talking about her family. I have one something, his something, Helen, uh, something parents are. So we were working on sort of possessive adjectives like my and his and things like that and basics. Um, and then I, I folded it, I think, in this case for some reason. Okay. But it's a very simple principle, just erase a bit of it. And there's that moment where you say, close your eyes, and they sit there like, oh no, I'm not going to read and you erase a few words and they open their eyes and then they go, oh, I do know that, I know that one. And it all gets very competitive and it's, it's a very simple thing to set up. So, that brings me to the end. Oh, just to leave you with what happens when you don't give board work much thought, it ends up looking kind of legible but a bit of a mess like this. So some general tips that I give are move as you write so you don't slant, that took me years to work out. <laughs> It gets harder as you get lower, so you need good knees. <laughs> um, divide the board into sections if you can. I love this folding board thing. Yeah. And you can move it up and down as yeah. well. Use different colors if possible. It was a dyslexic student who originally asked me to do this, and I never thought it was that valuable, and she found it really helpful. Um, take pictures of it, and students could too. Like when you did the instant gap fill, why not take a picture? You can use it later to check what you've erased or for a revision in future lessons. Use the projector or the beamer for feedback if you can. It gives a bit of extra visual support. And print. I'm very strict on this, not joining up letters on the board. I don't see any need. That's a feature of handwriting. This isn't a handwriting, it's a board. And I don't know what your groups are like, but mine are multilingual and a lot of them have trouble with the Roman script. Even students whose first language uses it, they don't always represent letters the same way. So, I stick with printing. And don't capitalize on that I'm going to leave you with my final pet peeve. <laughs> no need for capital letters where they don't belong. So if you're going to write a word like... A shoe, it's written like that. Not like that, because there's no reason why it would be capitalized. As long as I'm talking about words, I need to get my final pet peeve in there. So. <laughs> Please do get in touch. The slides will be available here on my blog address. How, how can you just follow the link and you then... I'll show you if you want. We're, we're out of time if people need to leave, but I'll show you if you have